college or your Yale connection, that's always welcome too. Um, so please do use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. We always like to see who's here and professor, uh, our professors like to read these later. They'll read some before we start and um, read some afterwards. So hi to John Hoffman, BA69 from Berkeley and JB from Atlanta. And there's Dusty from uh, Yale 82 to 84, still recall good chats with you in your comfy office. All right. Um, hi to Dusty, hi to Jill Cook, class of 81, Morse College. And Catherine Wolf says, hi, Allison. I saw this webinar and I had to sign up it for nothing else than to say hi. Awesome. <laughs> I promised Allison that some of her friends and students and um, collegial contacts would be tuning in. Hi to Stephen Yandel from Chicago, for, former associate dean at the law school. And hi to Kathy from Princeton, 74 and 78, and Ann Peters, School of the Environment, 76. Hi to Ann Chestnut uh, in Charlottesville, MFA, 81, School of Art. Hi to Mark Ross. Class of 73, uh, formerly uh, residential college, formerly known as Calhoun, now known as Grace Hopper. And hi to Mary, who's zooming in from Ghana, Davenport, class of 72. Awesome. Hi to Jill, who says, I love my primates class with Professor Richard. Um, excellent. And Michael Lamb, Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Cambridge. Happy to see my former VC, who I met at Yale so, so many years ago. Um, hi to Stuart, former student of Dr. Richards in the mid 70s, and Lauren uh, from Crofton, Maryland, graduate school, class of 86. Hi, Alan Kasdan, Sterling Professor of Psychology and longtime fan of Allison, who is, of course, a stellar scientist. Nice to see you. Hi to Stephanie, who is an urban designer from the city of Santa Monica and enjoying our climate change conversations, finding them extremely illuminating. Stephanie is an architect um, from Cornell, class of 86, and a colleague is an alum and invited. I, I'm glad you said that, Stephanie, because our um, presentations at Yale Alumni Academy are free. They are open to everyone. Anyone is welcome to tune in. Um, our programs are for Yale alumni, but we welcome friends of Yale alumni and family as well, and parents. I always enjoy seeing parents, enjoy seeing bulldogs of the last decade, Yale alumni, turning up and of course, um, the community that gets created by these conversations because so many of us from all over the world can be in one room together on Zoom and have a great opportunity to learn about new scholarship from our Yale faculty. Uh, and today we are here because uh, Professor Richard was very generous in reaching out to us and saying, hey, I've got a new book coming out and I would love to talk to the Yale alumni about it. And the book is called The Sloth Lemur's Song. You all are in the front row on the cutting edge uh, because the book was just published in September of 2022. And um, we are looking forward to a really exciting presentation today with Professor Allison Richard, uh, who is Senior Research Scientist in the Yale Anthropology Department and Franklin Muzzy Crosby Professor Emerita of the Human Environment. Professor Richard was also Provost of Yale from 1994 to 2002. She has studied ecology and social behavior of wild primates in Africa, Central America, and the Himalayan foothills, but she is most widely known for her research on lemurs in Madagascar. And I mentioned at the outset, her most recent book, The Sloth Lemurs Song, Madagascar from the Deep Past to the Uncertain Present. It's a far-reaching account of Madagascar past and present. And for over 40 years, of course, she has worked to help conserve the island's unique heritage and enhance its socioeconomic opportunities for people living in and around the forests in the Southwest. We're really delighted to talk about uh, climate change in the context of looking at Madagascar and some really fascinating information that Professor Richard is gonna share with us today. Before I go to that, I do wanna give a shout out to our climate change conversation series. So this is the second talk in our 2022 series, but this is the third year we've done this. So starting in 2020, we began featuring professors from around the university to talk about climate change, 
Uh, and we're really pleased this year to partner with the School of the Environment uh, and our Dean Indy Burke, who are really excited about being able to present the faculty, the scholarship, the research that's happening at the School of the Environment through these climate change conversations. So without further ado, I will turn over to Allison Richard. Please keep your introductions coming because I know she's going to enjoy knowing who's in the room, even if she doesn't have a chance to, uh, to check your names until after the presentation is over. And if you have questions, please do post your question in the Q&A box and not in the chat. We'll get to questions as soon as Professor Richard is done with her presentation. Over to you, Allison. Thank you very much, Lauren. I'm I'm sitting here transfixed as I watch the names roll by, and uh, and all I can say is hello to those of you I know, and salutations to those I don't. And you know, I hope that we will meet in person as well as sort of online like this. That's before too long. Um, so uh, with the COP twenty seven underway. Uh, and uh, here in uh, Middle Haddam, Connecticut, today it was 75 degrees as I uh, went outside a little while ago. It is uh, a, a timely and, and I think urgent uh, moment to be talking about climate change in the, uh, in the Yale Online Academy. And uh, my thanks to you, Lauren, for inviting me to speak today. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and, and I'm also, I'm, I'm honored. So, so thank you. Uh, and uh, so on to uh, Madagascar. And uh, let me begin by sharing my screen and seeing if I, uh, ah, there it is. Okay. So going back, uh, well, a year or two now, uh, to the COP26 in Glasgow, um, I'm showing here some of the headlines that uh, were sort of floating around that uh, gathering, uh, in which Madagascar was 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 held up as a as a, as, a, as it were as a poster child for uh, uh, the consequences of climate change uh, and uh, you know, the drought, uh, famine. Uh, and as uh, the UN report uh, uh, and others said, this is uh, the first famine caused by climate change. Um, so what are we to make of that? Well, the, the long-term data are unequivocal. Uh, this is uh, a, a compilation of simulation models done some years back uh, by the World Bank showing that uh, under the most conservative and uh, more aggressive projections, uh, Madagascar is going to get hotter in uh, the years to come uh, over the next 50 years. Uh, more recently, in fact, just last week, uh, Michael Coe from the Woodwell Climate Research Institute shared with me uh, this uh, uh, projection of uh, what's going to happen to uh, rainfall to precipitation in Madagascar over the next uh, uh, hundred years. So uh, the reality of climate change is not in doubt. However, that said, against the same backdrop of uh, drought and famine, uh, there was another set of voices that uh, called out saying, as we see here, climate change is a threat multiplier, but not the only one. With this particular drought, it was more the natural rain variability, the very high vulnerability of the population and the impact of COVID-19 that came together. So uh, I will come back uh, at the end of this talk to pondering how we are to put, how are we to interpret these two very different uh, uh, interpretations of what is happening in Madagascar against a backdrop of uh, very sophisticated and uh, complex modeling that tells us that climate change is a, a real phenomenon. But for this lecture, I want to... Uh, take a different approach for now. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is a distinctive long-term feature 
of Madagascar's climate, uh, its evolutionary consequences, and its possible future implications. This all began uh, with my research on uh, the great white lemur uh, found throughout southern Madagascar in forested areas, uh, Propithecus ferroxy, uh, which I began studying at, uh, uh, in a forest in southwest Madagascar at Beza Mafali in uh, 1984. Uh, at this point, we have been following about over 800 individuals through the course of their lives. Uh, and uh, it fairly soon became clear that these animals are weird. Uh, they weigh five or six pounds. So, you know, they're the size of, you know, a, a reasonably small pussycat. But over half of the females in this flourishing population have uh, not given birth for the first time by the time they're seven years old. And when they do reproduce, it's one infant usually every other year, uh, and they live uh, to the age of 30 or so, especially females. Females are very long lived in this population. It, it is as if they are leading their lives in the slow lane. And we wondered if this was really the case uh, and looked at uh, an array of primates, including Propithecus, the great white lemur, and we looked at relative life expectancy, and we looked at relative age at first reproduction, controlling for body size. And as you see, Propithecus is an outlier, uh, a considerable outlier, long life expectancy, late age at first reproduction, uh, truly life in the slow lane. So the next question is, what what to make of that? Are these just kind of, is this just a, a one weird species or is there more going on? So we turned to look at uh, other mammals uh, for which there are data. It's not easy to get long-term data on life history patterns. It takes sort of endless years of, of data gathering on large numbers of animals. This is uh, Cryptoproctoferox. Uh, the largest of the endemic family of Madagascar's carnivores, the Herpestidae. Um, and so we looked uh, at the data available uh, on five of the nine species in this family for which there were data. And as you see, the Herpestids are these triangles. And so here is another uh, order of mammals where uh, interbirth interval is long compared to uh, carnivores in Africa. That's where we, uh, African and Asian uh, 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 herpestids, they were called at the time. They, uh, the, um, the, the, the Madagascar's family has now been given its own, uh, its own distinctive family. So here we see in a different order of, of, of mammals, um, this life in the slow lane. Now, uh, uh, there aren't good data for uh, uh, the carnivores, but there are for the, uh, for the, for the primates. I, and I will spare you that, but just as there are primates that live their lives in the slow lane, there are primates that live their lives in the fast lane. But lest you think that I'm only focused on primates, look at this. This is uh, a little chameleon found in the southwest of Madagascar, first of all, uh, Labordi. Uh, of the 30,000 or so reptiles in the world, there are almost none that live their lives as fast as this chameleon does. Uh, it spends eight or nine months uh, in the egg. It hatches, grows up fast, reproduces, and then very quickly starts to show signs of decrepitude, as in they start falling out of trees and just kind of not behaving as they should. And they're dead within 12 months. So its entire life cycle uh, takes place within 12 months. So this is all very strange. So stepping back, uh, what might be the explanation for this uh, these extreme polarizations of life history patterns in, uh, in many of the uh, mammals and reptiles, certainly for others we don't know, 
of Madagascar. There is a body of theory, uh, life history theory, that uh, that, that 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 states that uh, either in if you live in unpredictable conditions where you don't know what's going to happen next, you have two options: either you speed up your life and reproduce fast while the going's good, or you hedge your bets. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and slow your life history pattern down. So that seemed to us uh, to be a plausible explanation for what we were seeing. And in parallel with my own work, my late husband, Robert Dewar, who is an archaeologist very interested in human agricultural systems and in how people coped with the environment in Madagascar, uh, he, with Jim Wallace, who was at the time uh, at the uh, Yale School of the Environment, uh, analyzed uh, between 20 and 40 years of monthly rainfall data from 1,500 rainfall stations around the world uh, in the subtropics and tropics. Uh, they, they threw out uh, rainfall stations where uh, there was more than 5% of missing data. So they actually started out with a bigger sample size than that, but they ended up with 1,500, with 1500 rainfall stations and a great deal of data, which they spent an incredible amount of time cleaning. Uh, and uh, then they posed the question uh, on a 10-year basis, uh, are there places in the world where the probability of a catastrophic fa failure of rainfall is particularly high, i.e. they are very unpredictable environments, uh, or particularly low, i.e. they're more than usually stable environments, or just average. Uh, what they came up with was a picture that uh, showed the, the eastern uh, region of South America to be a hotspot of unpredictability. Uh, the Cape York, I mean, there, there are various places in the world, but just to pick out the ones that jumped off the map, uh, the Cape York Peninsula uh, in Australia, uh, small islands, as one might expect, either you know, the rains hit or they don't hit. Uh, so there was, a, and, and coastal areas tend to be uh, quite unpredictable. Um, the problem was in Madagascar that there were only two rainfall stations that met the criteria for inclusion in this analysis. One of them in the Southwest showed high unpredictability, but another in the Central Highlands did not show high unpredictability from one year to another in rainfall. So Bob and I decided to pursue this further and we relaxed the conditions uh, and uh, accepted uh, data from meteorological stations with less complete records. And to our great disappointment uh, with respect to our hypothesis, uh, only three two in the extreme southwest and one way up here in the north came out as uh, hotspots of interannual and to unpredictability. High variability between years in the amount of rainfall. So we kind of paused and sighed and wondered whether to give up, but then uh, decided to plunge in and look a bit more closely. And uh, I'm not going to show the data for this, but all of these green points and some of the yellow points, it turns out that the variability takes a different form. We compared the pattern of rainfall within a year at these sites to the pattern of rainfall within a year in sites with comparable rainfall uh, in continental Africa. And what, jumped out of this analysis is that all of the, at all of these sites, uh, although the total volume of rainfall uh, every year was uh, pretty steady, the distribution of that rainfall in the course over the 12 months of the year was highly unpredictable compared to uh, uh, the sites um, that uh, we, we compared them with 
in uh, in in Africa, and so uh, it 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 did seem to us that uh, we, within this context of unpredictability of climate, there would there were the seeds of an explanation for what we were seeing with respect to life history patterns. Now, how long has this unpredictability prevailed? We don't know that, but uh, we are supposing, and there may be ways of getting at this in, 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 in finer detail, we are supposing that, uh, that this climate regime of hypervariability came into effect between five and seven million years ago. Uh, and we suspect that because at that point, Madagascar had reached its current position uh, with respect to longitude and latitude and with respect to the position of surrounding continents and the surrounding seas and its, 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 its complex topography with this uh, steep escarpment running down the east coast and central highlands sloping down to uh, lowlands, rolling lowlands in the west and the southwest, that all of that was in place by five to seven million years ago. And so it's a, it's a reasonable bet that, uh, that these conditions have, uh, have, have a deep his a, a history that's deep into the past. And all of the animals that we have talked about uh, have been in Madagascar for tens of millions of years. And so they would have been uh, exposed to these conditions uh, of hypervariability and, uh, and either went extinct or, or adapted, evolved uh, these, these strange, extreme uh, life histories. So that's the, uh, the, 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 the story uh, of the wildlife. But of course, people have not been in Madagascar for millions of years. Uh, people, uh, the, the, the earliest faint traces of human presence on the island uh, come from uh, chop it marks on uh, the long bones of elephant birds, two bones uh, dated to about 10,000 years ago. Um, and there is some you know, th there's some disagreement about whether these are crocodile teeth uh, marks or, or or chop marks, but uh, I, you know, that, I've, I've talked to all the people that look at these bones and uh, who've looked at these bones and have done this kind of analysis, and I'm reasonably confident that it's a marker of some kind of human presence 10,000 years ago. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are, again, traces of human activity and presence on the island, uh, though agriculture only gets underway. We start seeing signs of agriculture and the introduction of cattle to Madagascar in the eighth century in the common era. So turning to what this all means for people, let me sort of hasten to say, I am, I am not an agronomist. And so what I uh, am telling you today just comes out of my own observation and having worked uh, down in the southwest of Madagascar since 1975. And uh, what I can report is that uh, people, people that, 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 the, that, that the, the staple foods are maize and manioc and sweet potatoes, uh, and to some degree rice, though much of the rice is transported down from uh, the central highlands. Uh, people cultivate, it's, a, it's a primarily a subsistence cultivation system, uh, and their strategy is uh, you plant when it rains, and the seasonal rains normally start in November and continue through March into early April. You plant when it rains. If no more rain comes, you plant again. It's a strategy of, uh, of sort of continued effort in the face of unpredictability. Uh, people do innovate. I included this uh, slide on the right. Uh, that, uh, that's a, 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 a little bed for seedlings. Uh, we've been working uh, collaboratively with the community down there and uh, I, I wanted to sort of signal that because it is it is too easy to represent these people as just kind of 
traditional and close-minded. Uh, and uh, in my experience, the they're not. They're, they're, they're willing to innovate, but in, uh, in general, innovation fails uh, in this unpredictable environment. And also, in general, uh, the innovations are suggested by uh, experts visiting for short periods of time from elsewhere uh, who do not bear the costs of failure. Uh, the local population bear uh, the costs of failure. Um, but that strategy of, uh, of continued uh, relentless planting until you catch the right moment, um, in general, yields sufficient food for people to get by in times of, uh, of scarcity, as we have seen for the last uh, three years, uh, when crops have failed because the rain has all fallen on a very few days of the year, if at all, people resort to uh, famine foods in the forest. It's a reason that people value the forest as a source of food as well as medicine. Turning to uh, markets, uh, I, again, I put this in because uh, one sees the, the, the traditional sweet potatoes, manioc, uh, and, uh, and, and rice somewhere in the back of one of these. But uh, this is uh, a woman de la Prairie who is, uh, is, is creating a market garden on the banks of the river uh, that flows uh, through the area where we work. And uh, in addition to growing maize, she is growing a whole range of new market crops uh, with great uh, enthusiasm and very successfully using water uh, that comes from the bottom of a very deep uh, um, uh, sort of dip in the riverbank, the, in, the, in the bed of the river. So the, the river doesn't run with water, but if you dig down five or six feet, you find water in the water table and she is using that to grow these crops. Uh, as, as are no, no few others, particularly women. So uh, let, me, let me stop here. So what is one to conclude from uh, what I have been uh, saying here. How are we to think about all of this? Turning to the first, my first observations about the uh, Madagascar as a poster child for climate change and Madagascar on the other hand as, uh, you know, not being that, but rather being uh, an example of, uh, non-climate related impacts. And amongst those, uh, I would include uh, uh, locust migrations, uh, the invasion of army worms from Southern Africa, which since 2016 have been progressively devastating maize crops across the Southwest. I would include uh, not decades, but centuries of underinvestment uh, in the South, in the infrastructure of the South, going all the way back to the 18th century, uh, the, the, when Madagascar first became, started functioning as a state, and then through the time of French colonization from 1896 to 1960, the South was really terra incognita. The roads were not developed, uh, water managed system, systems were not developed, and things have not progressed much in truth since then. The roads are still terrible, access is still terrible. There is little or no water infrastructure. And all of these, uh, all of these are, are, are combining uh, along with uh, 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 low rainfall over the last three years to produce the drought and famine that we have seen. Um, just this year, in fact, uh, a group of, uh, of climate experts uh, who formed uh, the, the World Weather Attribution Collective, and they are highly regarded climate experts. And Harrington et al. Uh, just published a paper uh, in which they uh, looked at all of the evidence uh, for Madagascar uh, for the last uh, several decades 
and concluded that indeed uh, the, 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 the drought that we are seeing now uh, was found, there was a, a comparable drought in, uh, in 2008 and 2010 and in 1992-93. Uh, and uh, and in fact, the drought in 1992-93 was 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 worse than anything that we're seeing now. Uh, and they peg, uh, based on long-term modeling, they peg the current event as a once in a hundred and thirty-seven year event, uh, and not uh, driven at this time by climate change. So. I, you know, what what are we to make of that? And you know, what I what you know for me because I work on the ground with these communities, uh, it seems to me that uh, the long term climate projections uh, are they're vital. They drive macro policy. Uh, they drive strategic investment. Uh, they 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 show us with with some degree of precision what's coming at us, and surely as we see this COP twenty seven un, unrolling and the sort of the, the, the seeming reluctance of the world to come to grips with this, uh, they serve as a, as a powerful powerful uh, tool with which to try to sort of bludgeon our world into greater action on this front. Uh, for me, in the work that I do with my colleagues at the University of Antananarivo and with the community in Southwest Madagascar, uh, they are good to think with, uh, but they are not, uh, they're not very helpful in saying, so what should we try next year? And that brings me to what I was talking about with this, uh, with the the, the long term evolutionary perspective, um, if 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 I I like to believe I think that there is a glimmer of hope from the evolutionary context. Uh, I think that what that tells us is that the wildlife of Madagascar and indeed uh, the plants. Uh, ninety-five percent of which, like the animals, are found nowhere else on Earth. That these are the 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 the, the, the natural environment of Madagascar uh, has been adapting to, evolving to respond to hypervariability and unpredictability and extreme conditions over millions of years. And that this, uh, perhaps, one hopes, uh, gives them some kind of uh, advantage, some kind of springboard uh, as they uh, sort of come to grips with what lies ahead. Uh, this is not to say that uh, we're not very focused on trying to ensure that there are corridors of natural habitat uh, so that animals can escape and uh, move into other regions, uh, more northerly regions of the island where these particularly extreme conditions uh, are not predicted to take hold. So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not betting on, uh, on the wildlife being able to cope with what's coming at them, but, uh, but, but it, does, uh, it does seem to me that... Uh, Taking a long view of the past gives one, as I say, some glimmer of hope that uh, that these creatures uh, and their and the forests and grasslands in which they live are pre-adapted uh, to to cope uh, with uh, with hyper variability and, and unpredictability. Uh, and indeed, with uh, with intermittent uh, and 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 more frequent drought, so that's for the wildlife. Now, for people, it's I think it is hard to say. And uh, fifty years from now, uh, there may be nobody left living in the south. 
Um, certainly at this moment in time, uh, there are people migrating out of the South, moving up into the West, which is causing from a, a, a conservation point of view, its own array of problems as people are uh, clearing forests to make fields to, to feed themselves uh, reasonably uh, and understandably enough. But, uh, but I, again, would say that uh, for over a thousand years, uh, people have shown a remarkable ability to adapt to whatever nature was throwing at them and to cope with uh, hypervariability uh, and the, 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 the overall climate characteristics uh, of the island. And so uh, we live in a dark world, or at least I find that we live in a very dark world. And, uh, and, and, and I certainly, uh, uh, despair is not an option. And so one looks for reasonable grounds uh, for hope uh, and also uh, practical grounds uh, for uh, finding uh, things that one might do uh, in the short term. Uh, in the longer term, uh, we see what the future looks like. Uh, in the short term, uh, my concern is that other pressures, um, the pressures of pests, the pressures of charcoaling, uh, uh, and the pressures of, uh, of, of, of poverty induced by a complete lack of, uh, of, of investment or a, a large lack of investment in this region that, uh, and incompetence, uh, managerial incompetence at the highest levels of government, um, that these will uh, effectively destroy what is left of the natural world in Madagascar before the real effects of climate change uh, are, are, are before our eyes. Um, it's uh, so. So anyway. So so. I I uh, I, I struggle today uh, with the weather outside and with what's going on in Egypt and everything else that's going on in the world uh, to 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 find positives. But I believe and I hope that there are positives in what I have been uh, saying to you here. And uh, I think that with that, uh, I will uh, I will stop. I, I, I find, I mean, I, I have to say, I'm much more interested in listening to, to you. I mean, all of these talks I've been giving lately, uh, listening to people's questions and observations seems to me to be a lot more interesting than what I have to say. And I see my role as simply to set up the conversation. And with all of you here online, I would now uh, hand over to, uh, to, to Lauren and uh, look forward to hearing your observations, comments, and, and if I can, I will certainly uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much, and back to you, Lauren. Thank you, Alison, for a great presentation, and um, thank you for all the work that you put into giving us such a vast picture of the varieties of wildlife um, in Madagascar. I know you you made the effort to put some um, some beautiful illustrations together for us, so we really appreciate that. Um, and I know we have some questions already. If you have questions, please do post them in the q and I saw a few of you had posted questions in the chat and I'll try to find them, but sometimes they get buried as the chat continues on. So if you could please um, post your questions in the Q&A, that makes it a lot easier. Um, I wanted to just give a few additional shout outs. So I wanted to say hi to Bill Conway um, at the Cleveland Botanical Garden that has a Madagascar biome. That sounds very interesting. So if you're in Cleveland, you should probably check that out. And I wanted to say hi to Ed, who led the World Bank program to Madagascar in the 1980s. Um, and I also wanted to say hi to David Myers, who is leading the Yale Alumni Academy travel pro program to Madagascar in 2023. And hi to all of you who are on this call. I saw Robert 
um, who was registered to go on that program. So hi to everyone who's planning to travel to Madagascar. So, so can, I, can, I, can I just jump in, Lauren, yeah, and say, first in. of all, so sort of, hi to, to David Myers, who I've known well for many, many, many years. Uh, and I'm very jealous that you uh, are going on a cruise, David. Um, but also, uh, I don't know Bill Conway uh, uh, in Missouri, but the Missouri, I just to give Missouri a shout out, Missouri Botanical Gardens uh, are not only uh, key leaders with colleagues in Madagascar of what we know about uh, uh, the, you know, the, the systematics of Madagascar's plants, uh, but also doing extraordinary work uh, with communities, helping to conserve natural vegetation in the east and in the south I vis and in the far north. I visited uh, Orangea and I plan to visit the south up the Mandrari River and I'm filled with admiration for all that uh, Chris Birkenshaw and Jani and, uh, and Pete Lowry, of course, the team have been doing uh, in Madagascar. So three cheers for the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Just Anyway, yes. Yeah, so I I do want to just because Bill was so kind to put his introduction, say that he's from the Cleveland Botanical Gardens. But, oh, but Cleveland. Oh dear, yeah. oh dear. <laughs> but I heard Missouri. Missouri. I heard Missouri. Yeah. Bill, I apologize. I'm sure That's Cleveland right. is doing great things too. Yeah, no, it's good to. I mean, the thing is about these presentations is we never know who's going to show up, but we always know that they're going to be really fascinating people yeah. in the room with us and so that's and, wonderful. and if i if i can make a, a bigger point i'm sorry that i mistook <laughs> cleveland for missouri how terrible <laughs> but 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 the, but the broader point which i think is uh is really positive is that uh there is a lot of international collaboration uh uh, and and what used to be the case when I started working in Madagascar, uh, all of the science uh, was being done by uh, people from Europe, the UK, and the US. And Malagasy people were serving as research assistants in all of that. That has been transformed, and today there is uh, a rising generation of Malagasy conservation biologists and scientists who are increasingly taking the lead and working in these wonderful international partnerships. And uh, it's universities, it's the zoological society world, it's, uh, it's the botanical gardens world. Uh, and uh, I, I know that's, that in itself is something sort of greatly, greatly to be appreciated. And I think a, a really interesting topic to talk about with regard to conservation. And so perhaps we can get to it um, when we get to people's questions. Um, be, just before we go to questions, I do want to remind everyone that our faculty do these presentations um, out of their generosity of their scholarship because they want to share their scholarship with the Yale alumni community. And, um, and the way that we thank them is by supporting their publications. And so um, Professor Richards has a book out called The Sloth Lemur Song. And I'm posting in the chat uh, where you can purchase a copy of that book on Amazon. If you would like to get a copy, I really encourage everyone to, um, to purchase the book support the research that our Yale faculty are doing, support Professor Richard and the importance of, um, of all of these sort of important topics that she's bringing to light with regard to Madagascar. So, so, Lauren, so Lauren, thank you very much. And let me just say that I didn't set her up to say that. She says she volunteered to say that <laughs> I've, I've as, herself. Yeah, uh, I and, uh, but anyway, and I also, <laughs> Lauren, just just kind of, you know, I, I, there, there was always some discussion about how long does one talk on these occasions? And I just want to say I work really hard to keep what I said short because I'm eager to hear uh, what everybody says. And, and having seen some of the names of all of you who were there has made me even more eager to, to listen. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we have a, a number of questions here. If you posted your question in the chat before, if you want to repost it in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, I want to just start with Ed's question. Uh, please, can you comment on the successes or, or failures or and failures of the Malagasy state in responding to the challenges you described and the possibilities for the future? Can, can, I didn't hear. What, what did you say? Can I comment on what? on the successes and failures of the, essentially of the government in Madagascar in responding to the challenges you describe and to the possibilities of, of the future? Well, uh, 
first of all, the Madagascar now, uh, when I started working there, there were 11 protected areas in the whole country that had been established under French colonial rule. They were huge protected areas that had been imposed from the top down. Madagascar now uh, today has a network of over 123 protected areas. Um, they particularly expanded between 2001 and 2010 uh, when uh, 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 Mark Ravalumanana was president. Um, so, uh, so, so there is a large protected area network. There is a uh, the legislative environment and the policy, the formal policy and legislative environment are are very forward looking and uh, and quite aggressive. The problem is with the implementation, uh, and the implementation has been, shall we say, weak at best. Um, the, the reasons for that are, are multiple, incompetence, lack of attention, you know, corruption, uh, uh, lack of strong government. Uh, you know, there, 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 there are multiple, multiple reasons for this, but I've just been reviewing a paper uh, that Julia uh, Jones uh, sent me, uh, who is at Bangor University. And uh, th there's a, been a kind of an unfortunate natural experiment over the last few years um, with COVID. Uh, COVID had two consequences. There was complete lockdown in Madagascar uh, and also ecotourism collapsed. And the revenue from ecotourism was what was supporting the national park system. Um, and uh, what they have done, what she and her colleagues have done, is look at uh, levels of fires and uh, cutting in, uh, the, the, in, in, a, in a large number of the island's uh, national parks before COVID and since COVID when things are all picking up. And, uh, and it is a kind of perverse mm -hmm. test of the effectiveness of the national park system, because what one sees is the, a spike in cutting and burning during COVID, uh, partly perhaps because the law wasn't being enforced, enforced, partly because people were bored and desperate and looking worried about their future. Uh, but that has now declined again. So that is good news. Uh, looking at the Red Plus program, the carbon credits program in Madagascar, that and the three areas where that has uh, been uh, carried out, been implemented, it's been enormously successful um, and 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 demonstrably so. Now, you know, uh, legislation has just recently been passed that actually kind of puts a a, a lid on uh, all but the World Bank's uh, uh, red programs, which is most un unfortunate. And one hopes that the current government or whatever government will come in after the elections next year will reverse that decision. So, so there are, you know, it, it's it, it. There are. There's a lot of bad news coming out of Madagascar. To, to, to kind of put some context on that, I was advising. Uh, uh, a, a Canadian broadcasting corporation uh, filming company in the early 80s. Uh, they were making a film about what was going on in Madagascar. And I remember vividly uh, the producer of that film saying to me, I don't know why you bother. The last tree is burning. What's, why are you spending so much time and energy on conservation in Madagascar? And I said to her, uh, the last tree is not burning. There's a lot still left. There are problems, but there is a lot still left. Well, that was 1985. What I would say to you in 2022, there's a lot still left, less than there was in 1985, but still a lot left. And that speaks to uh, an ethic of uh, stewardship uh, in many places on the ground in, in Madagascar, not all by any means, but in many places. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just sort of one other sort of ob observation uh, is that uh, the, the environmental problems there are very commonly laid uh, at, it used to be under French colonial rule, it was the Malagasy people who were either destructive pyromaniacs or ignorant or wicked or whatever, who were destroying the environment. 
that narrative has changed uh, and that it's the poor people of Madagascar. They're poor and therefore they destroy the environment. But Ivan Scales, uh, a colleague and friend at Cambridge University, traced the history of widespread destruction of forest in the southwest of Madagascar between 1990 and 2001. There was huge deforestation in the dry forests of the southwest at that time. Uh, and if you were out there, what you saw were sort of poor subsistence farmers with their axes cutting down the forest. However, uh, what what precipitated this was a very well-intentioned EU uh, uh, policy uh, which lowered tariffs in certain developing countries uh, in return for growth in their kind of their, their agricultural industries. Uh, and at that point in time, Réunion decided to go into pig husbandry. Uh, but Réunion is not a good place to grow maize to feed the pigs. The Malagasy government saw an opportunity, built big silos in the southwest, middlemen came in, people went out into the forest, cleared it, grew maize, the maize was then bought, transported back to Réunion to feed the pigs. So though what you see is one hand on the axe out there in the forest, in fact, there were many hands on the axe, reaching all the way back to well-intentioned policymakers in Europe. So simple stories of peasants destroying forests don't, don't add up. Uh, uh, and, you know, wherever you look on the island, there are, there are sort of stories, uh, not the same story, but comparable stories of complex factors coming together uh, that are driving uh, the, the current loss of, loss of habitat, which is considerable. There is no question about that. I think, yeah, I think you make uh, a point that you touched on a little bit in the beginning of your presentation, which is the sort of the well-intentioned outside gaze and its sort of disastrous results when it's not combined with local on the ground or indigenous knowledge. So I wonder if you could just expand on that point a little bit more. Uh Yes, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so hesitating. I guess I would. I, 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 what were you going to say? I was going to say, I would, I would phrase it as to what extent is there an effort to elevate and empower uh, indigenous Malagasy people who have ideas about what needs to be done and how it will affect? There, there is a, uh, a growing and real effort. I mean, how does one quantify an answer to your question? I, I would say everywhere I look, uh, well, let me take another sort of, if th th there are a, a proliferating number of local, uh, either very local or regional or national en environmental NGOs in Madagascar, uh, led by Malagasy conservation Act activists or, or scientists, the international NGOs, the bingos, uh, WWF, the Peregrine Fund, uh, WCS, they all now are, they have Malagasy leadership, uh, Missouri Botanical Garden, Malagasy leadership. And uh, and and they are, those, those Malagasy leaders are very attuned to local knowledge. Um, just, just as a kind of interesting sort of footnote to this, you talk about indigenous knowledge, that, that, that ad adjective is an interesting adjective because uh, the Malagasy are very rarely positioned as indigenous. They're positioned as people who destroy the environment and the, you know, the paradise of Madagascar. Now, you know, they came from Indonesia and from Africa between 10,000 and, uh, and, and 1,200 years ago. Uh, sort of, you know, my, you know, part of my question is, how do you qualify? How long do you have to be somewhere to be called indigenous? I mean, it's a, it's a different, it's a different question. But, uh, but I, I mean, just term, you know, terming this as local knowledge, uh, there is much more attention being paid to local knowledge. Not, not that everybody has, you know, I mean, not that all of the answers are with local knowledge. It's about collaboration and partnership, which is very difficult. When, when I started working with, you know, with my colleagues at the university and the community in Southwest Madagascar, 
No, I thought it was a partnership. Uh, but that's actually rubbish. I mean, from their point of view, here we were, we were rich, we were powerful, we were educated, we had connections to the government in the central, in the center. Uh, and so there was a real asymmetry in that relationship. On the other hand, we knew that we could only be there if they invited us because they could have made sure that it was not viable for us to work there. And uh, it's take, it took decades for us to, just by working alongside one another and with one another and having successes and having failures, uh, it took a very long time for that relationship to approximate something like uh, a, a, a real partnership of trust. We're good neighbors to one another now. Uh, and I worry that we don't have decades going forward to form such relationships. They have to, those, those that that trust, that sense of collaboration has to happen much faster than we made it happen. And I think with the knowledge that we have now, if we, if I had known then what I now know, uh, we would have worked in different ways. Uh, but it's 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 been a journey for everyone. Well, you've touched on a lot of things that um, that people have raised as questions and question that's come up a couple of times um, is about tourism. And, you know, you mentioned it a little bit when you talked about, um, you know, what happened during the COVID period. And Dusty raises the point, uh, traveling in 2019 throughout Madagascar, if it wasn't for the protected areas, that most of what was seen was mainly agriculture and rather sad and dirty towns, although the food was very good. So um, how important is tourism in Madagascar? Is it justified and viable in a world facing the need to cut back on carbon output related to travel? Um, and there was another question, Elliot wanted to know how has tourism affected the Southwest and the country as a whole? So if you, if you, care to elaborate on the issue of tourism and the sort of delicate balance between the value that tourism brings to Madagascar and the cost that it places on, on the environment? Well, I mean, tourism is not, uh, it's not, I mean, it, well, it, as I said, collapsed under, under COVID as it did universally. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, an you know, you're asking two questions, I think, here. Uh, so it is, uh, it, it, it's a very bumpy source of revenue as, as many, as you know, all eco-tourist destinations in the world have seen that over the last few years. Uh, that said, uh, I believe it is of, uh, it is of, of, of great and growing value to Madagascar. I mean, I, you know, yes, uh, it it involves the use of fossil fuels uh, to get people from A to B, but I just can't imagine a world in which travel doesn't happen, uh, and that we you know we will and are finding more efficient ways of traveling. And so I just I I I mean others may differ about this, but I can't find myself saying we sh nobody should leave home. Nobody should see other parts of the world. We need to see each other's worlds uh, in order to uh, uh, to understand one another and work with one another and form relationships with one another, I believe. Now, with respect to Madagascar in particular, um, you, it's not for the faint-hearted. I mean, that's for sure, you know, but partly because the roads are not good in many places and, and it's not easy to, to, to see things. Uh, and there are no giraffes and zebras and lions and wildebeest. Madagascar, you know, the, the magic of Madagascar comes in small parcels, shall we say. Uh, but I'm always, I have, I've met a lot of people who have been eco-tourists to Madagascar. I've met them in Madagascar and I've met them sort of back here in the UK or the States. And I'm amazed that almost everybody fell in love with the place because I sometimes think, oh, despite kind of the ordeals that you went through and, you know, the absence of large sort of fierce creatures, you loved it. And people did. Uh, there is a magic about the place and, and its uniqueness. Um, it, it, you know, the, eco the, the way that it is now set up is that most eco-tourists go to a limited number of places 
uh, on the island, which are set up for ecotourism with good welcome centers and some hotel accommodation and so on and so forth. Uh, the revenues that come from that then flow back to the central government and are then redistributed to support areas that are never likely, that are important from an ecological point of view, but which are never likely to get uh, uh, many tourists coming to them. So, so, so you know, within the country, the uh, the destinations uh, for ecotourism are you know are, are again very variable. But I don't. I mean that that's a manageable that's a manageable challenge, and I think the Malagasy do. Uh, uh, the national park system does quite a good job of managing that redistribution effort. Okay, I want to move to a little bit to um, some of the questions about science, uh, the science side of the conversation. So there were a lot of questions about rain, actually. Um, and Ed asked for a clarification on a point that you made very early in the presentation about um, rain variability. And uh, Ed says, just simply, is is that not a function of climate change? So, just wondering if you, if you want to clarify on that point. Uh, no, uh, at this point in time, uh, the variability that uh, that is, you know, which is the demonstrable variability, has uh, uh, has has sort of ample precedence from the past before one can. Sort of, you know, you get the, the record, the climate, the, the rainfall records go back far enough uh, to be able to say with some confidence that the particular events that we are seeing now cannot be reasonably attributed uh, to sort of long term climate change. Uh, this is the paper uh, that I was uh, referring to by uh, Harrington et al. Uh, uh, from this uh, World Weather Attribution. Uh, uh, co collaborative and uh, uh, you know I, it's a, it's a very technical paper. Uh, when I first read it, not being a very technical person, I wondered, you know, are these people really serious? Because there's you know, there's, there's there's a lot of stuff going on out there. Um, but I've I've shared it and asked a number of people who are highly respected climate experts like Michael Coe at the Woodwell Climate Research Institute. And uh, and, and it's a serious analysis. Um, but I just you know, I just want to reiterate the point that the uh, in that same paper, uh, they are emphatic as Tadros was in the World Bank analysis in 2008. Uh, you know, the, the, that Madagascar's climate is undergoing long-term changes invol involving a warming trend and changes in rainfall is is without question. Is without question. Uh, it's it to, for me. It's kind of how do you put that together with the the complexities of the present and then do something, act. Uh, what are, you know? What is the call for action? Um, Okay, and I, I want to follow that with a question from George, who um, who sort of wants to interrogate the data and the modeling a little bit more to find out if it suggests that climate change is increasing the variability, or is it simply pushing the variations in, in one direction uh, or the other? So, for example, is it pushing the variations toward being hotter and less rainfall, or is it just increasing the variability overall? Uh, over the next 50 years uh, or 100 years, uh, the, the, the predictions, the, mod the, the models, all of the models are saying that Madagascar will get warmer. You know, by how much warmer will depend on what happens globally. But, you know, the models are showing what happens with somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees C. Those are the models that I have been looking at. Uh, as always, uh, the, the, the confidence uh, with which rainfall pre precipitation can be predicted, and the agreement of the models about that is lower. Uh, what seems to be, uh, well, what, what Harrington et al.'s modeling is showing, which is the most recent that I've seen, uh, but, you know, don't, you know, it, 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 this changes through time. What they're showing, which is interesting, is that the south of Madagascar gets hotter and drier uh, 
with an un, you know with unpredictable droughts at more frequent intervals and fewer days of the year on which rain falls more rain in shorter periods of time but up in the central highlands and in the north uh, rainfall may actually increase uh, so and and that's not i mean that it's not the first time that i have uh, encountered that i sort of I, I can't tell you at this moment but i remember being sort of caught by uh, a paper uh, suggesting that in the central highlands it would be possible to get in two rice crops in a year in in, a, in an annual cycle instead of the one currently because there would be greater rainfall but you know the interaction of rainfall and temperature and of soil conditions and of the vegetation are so complex uh that i i i i think uh you know there is there is no very clear future scenario yeah and i think you're the point that you're making is is an important one which is that you know we can look at the factors we can look at the history we can look at what the data tells us about what happened in the past but knowing how that's going to play out in the future is there's just so many different variables that it's it's very very hard to predict but some things are clear the heating is clear uh and the change in in precipitation is clear. The South, I think, there's 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 a fair amount of agreement about the South getting drier still, uh, more droughts, longer droughts, uh, as I say. Further north, the the agreement of the models breaks down somewhat. But just in the in the in the years that when I, mean, I first started really paying attention to this. Uh, I mean, and this is kind of a reflection on the times. When we started out in 1975, I have to say, I mean, this is kind of a measure of kind of, you know, lack of foresight, lack of vision. We weren't thinking about climate change in 1975. We were thinking about charcoaling and deforestation to open up fields. It's really uh, since, uh, you know, th the work that was begun by the World Bank, actually, in Madagascar, modeling future climates uh, over the last three decades, that uh, my, my, my attention has increasingly been drawn uh, to that and to reading all of this very technical, very complex uh, modeling work, which I don't fully understand except the take home messages. But in particular, thinking about what does it mean for me as somebody who is working on the ground with, a, with, you know, with communities in the Southwest? That's what I keep coming back to. Okay. Um, and I want to kind of go to Dusty's question related to that. A couple of people asked about internal displacement, essentially. You know, are people going to be moving from drier areas to wetter areas? Are protected um, areas at risk because uh, populations of people may try to relocate? So, I mean, certainly uh, uh, the, the, the West, uh, now the Western deciduous forests, uh, the Mena Bay uh, are being hollowed out uh, at the moment. And this is people moving up out of the south now to get away from the drought. And there is a, a, a crisis uh, uh, there. I mean, it's a, it's a very biodiverse region. The forest uh, regenerates very slowly uh, in these dry areas. And, uh, and so, uh, there's a lot of attention. There are many uh, NGOs and uh, National Park Service. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a kind of crisis convergence on the Mena Bay, uh, trying to do something about it. Um, but I, you know, deforestation for uh, fields is the problem in the West. But Madagascar is such a diverse environment. Uh, the you know the problem in the, the problems are very region specific, specific. What I would say in the southwest, and uh, you know, I was there this this summer. I was there for a month. Is um, that uh, do you, you know leveling the landscape for the production of charcoal is a huge uh, huge challenge, huge problem, and. Uh, you know, that is a problem that needs to find a completely different kind of solution. People have to cook their food and you know, that's they have to cook their food and charcoal is what there is. And there have been efforts, all of which have been unsuccessful to shift 
people, households to using other means, uh, certain, you know, fuel efficient stoves for a start, but even those have not been uh, widely uh, taken up in Madagascar, as they have been in some parts of Kenya, I know, and in other parts of the world, but not in Madagascar. Those are things that need to be looked at urgently, because uh, when you drive from the southwest coast towards uh, inland, it's like a moonscape as far as the horizon. Uh, the land has been scraped bare, uh, and uh, every year, the charcoalers are moving further up that road. Um, and, you know, they, until there is a, an alternative that has been developed, I believe, in collaboration, in a very tight partnership with people locally who understand what does and doesn't work, um, that, is, uh, that is a threat on a time scale that is uh, vastly more accelerated uh, than the threat of uh, than, than what's coming at us with uh, with climate change. It's that's a really interesting point because it's so obvious, and yet it's you know it's not the top. It's not the news headlines that people are thinking about. Right? People need cooking fuel, and you know until you give them a viable alternative, this problem yes. is going to be the priority. Well, it's. I mean, it has. Uh... It has been on people's minds and a source of great frustration uh, in uh, in Madagascar that no viable solution has been found to this. I mean, in the central highlands, uh, uh, there are huge plantations of eucalyptus, which are coppiced, and that produces charcoal. Now we can talk about the carbon emissions, but you know that that sort of before you get to the carbon emissions, you get to the kind of the destruction of vegetation. Coppicing of eucalyptus is not viable in the southwest because uh, the rainfall is too low to support uh, eucalyptus plantations that can be effectively coppiced. A, a solution would be to transport uh, charcoal produced from these these big plantations in the Central Highlands down to the Southwest. For various reasons, uh, the Southwest region wants to be sort of autonomous with respect to its fuels uh, and you know, transportation carries its own costs, you know, costs of, of money, but also costs in uh, you know, uh, 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 carbon emissions uh, and costs in expanding the, uh, the, 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 the surface area of, 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 uh, of these plantations. So uh, it's 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 really complicated. Uh, it's, it's very it's very complicated. It's very complicated. Yes. Um, I, we have a couple of interesting questions from Jonathan, which follow this theme. Although you know, they would have maybe been better placed a few minutes before we started talking about this um, this uh, charcoal issue. But I, I still want to pose them. Jonathan says, uh, what about arborization? Can that take hold in the present climate in southern Madagascar? Has it been tried? Um, does the air's relative humidity offer a possible path to sourcing water out of a little preci uh, precipitation? Of irrigation. Of uh, arborization. So I think it's sort of, sort of planting trees that affect the pattern of rainfall. Oh, yeah, no, that has, I mean, no, it's a great idea. And nobody has, uh, has, has, has looked at that. Yes, that's, uh, it, it, it's, yes, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, but yeah, to be pursued, to be pursued, I think. Um, the, it's just, I, I, all, all, these efforts of reforestation, uh, ha, uh, have very low success rates. We have been doing some sort of trials on a very modest basis with local with the with the communities with whom we work and uh for one reason or another lack of rainfall or livestock uh the success rate uh of, of reforestation is low um i i my own thoughts turn more to better water management i mean it's dry but you know as i said with the you know the lady of the the, the lady in the photograph with the big squash, uh, you don't have to dig very far down to reach the water table. Um, but uh, the, 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 there, there is a lack of wells and a lack of good water management uh, in southern Madagascar. There are a few experiments now going on with, with, with good water management infrastructure. And uh, I 
think, I mean, not, not, that's, I saw a question flashing up about growing rice. Somebody as in the chat room, it didn't, I didn't see the full question, but, uh, you know, when we first arrived there and uh, in the started working there in 1975 in the southwest and we're talking to the local community about what they really wanted what they wanted first and foremost was the renovation of an irrigation canal that allowed them to go rice in the southwest because rice is is highly valued a french colonist had put in an irrigation canal to the big unilahi river and for a decade or so in a golden era everybody had been able to grow rice. Well, the Unilahi River changed it, its course. The irrigation canal was completely inundated by sand. And so when we are in 1969, so when we arrived in 1975, everybody said, let us, let us renovate the irrigation canal. And that was absolutely front and center to everybody's uh, ideas. And so lo and behold, with great effort in the 1980s, we got a big USAID grant to do just that. And it turned into an absolute casebook study of the disasters of big top down <laughs> USAID projects. I mean, everything went wrong uh, and the canal was never uh, rehabilitated and people then got their spades out and they dug a much smaller irrigation canal and they grow a little rice at great human cost to doing it is very laborious and it makes no sense in agriculturally agronomically uh in that region and it makes total sense culturally because rice is really valued and so you invest in what you really value and uh that's you know uh as we all do wherever we live right so uh it's it's hard but uh, I, I think you, I think it gets to the point of the importance of incorporating the local knowledge and the local understanding of the culture into whatever um, decisions are made, because it, it, it doesn't make sense when you look at it from the outside perspective. Um, and it, it was April's point that just comparing it to crops being grown here in the U.S., um, in the desert, in the western deserts of the U.S., rice and alfalfa crops being grown uh, being grown and um, and how that's that's not neither is that sustainable um, in the West. And there was someone else who actually posted a comment about the American Dust Bowl experiences um, and whether or not that informs us uh, with an understanding of how to look at what's happening in the South in Madagascar. Yes, I mean, there, in the extreme South, there are now, you know, there are sand, there have been sandstorms over these, uh, over these past years. But you, you, what you see, you don't generally see a dust bowl situation. I mean, what you see is, the, is, is, you know, crops, the, you know, small scale sort of cultivation going on, uh, except, you know, where forest has just been cleared for charcoaling purposes. So uh, I wouldn't I I wouldn't draw an analogy with the dust bowl now, uh, but you know, will that come? Maybe there are there are efforts underway now to introduce uh, millet and sorghum, which, uh, as I say, I'm not an agronomist, but I am told that as crops, those are crops that uh, certainly the agronomists I know, Skip Barber, who was at the Yale School of the Environment, have always been mystified as to why millet and uh, sorghum were not being grown in Madagascar until now. Now on the Huram Bay, on this sort of this high plain in the southwest, there is now sorghum being very successfully grown, and maybe that will spread and particularly since uh, the army worm, this uh, uh, this moth, the army worm is a moth, in fact. Uh, but uh, at all stages in its development, and particularly as a as a as a larva, it attacks um, uh, all stages in the development of maize. And that there seems to be absolutely no solution other than the extensive application of uh, pesticides. No biological control mechanisms have been developed that I know of. So whether maize will remain a staple crop and what the transition to something other than maize looks like over the coming years, uh, I, don't, I don't know. But when I was there this summer, uh, it, there was field after field after field of shattered maize uh, 
plants, not because of the drought, uh, but because uh, this uh, army worm had got to them. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, I suppose you could say the good news for this year is that it has been dry enough that uh, there has not been a big infestation, an invasion by locusts. Um, so, you know, well, that's, that's one good thing. Um, I think uh, there was a question for, um, John, from Jonathan whether Israeli agronomists had been involved in looking at options for Madagascar. Say, say that again. Is, Jonathan had this question about Israeli agronomists, wondering if you were aware if they had been tackling water issues there. Uh, yes. Yes, I mean there, there, there are there are, I mean there are small, not to scale, uh, efforts going on down around uh, um, uh, 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 anyway, that, 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 yes, way down in the south, they need to get to scale. I mean this this is this is something uh, as a general observation. When I look across the landscapes of Madagascar, I can point out to you uh, particular places where interesting and effective things seem to be going on. Uh, how do you multiply them? Um, how do you scale them up uh, or scale them out? And uh, that was something that in the 80s at, uh, at, at where I work at Beza, uh, the large development agencies would come by and they would say, well, this is all lovely uh, and quaint, but it's one community and you need to scale it up uh, to which, uh, which, I, you know, to which my reply was, well, if you scale it up, then it's no longer community based. It's a large top down project. Uh, and there were endless conversations, which I found extremely annoying uh, because we were working really hard. But part of the reason that I was extremely annoyed is, because, of course, they were right. They were right. It was too small scale. Uh, but I didn't see a way out of it. None of us saw a way out of it. Uh, but what has happened in the last uh, decade, really driven by insecurity with respect to banditry, uh, in 2009, there was a military coup in the capital and law and order broke down across the country and banditry took a huge cattle raiding, but also just sort of theft on a large scale, uh, took a, a huge, huge leap up. And local communities uh, got together around the, with our community and said, you have got a local, local social contract in place to conserve your forests, and it seems to work very well. Why don't we form a larger social contract uh, to sort of protect ourselves from banditry? And so initially it was six communes, then it went to 13 communes, then it went all the way to the coast and up to the river. And four years ago, amazingly, uh, people started saying, well, this is working really well for security and we feel very safe, but we value our forests too. Let's flip this into a, uh, a, a, a conservation uh, DINA uh, social contract as well. And so now these communes are all working with one another and the knowledge is moving from commune to commune. The conversation is from commune to commune. So it isn't scaling up, but it's scaled out in ways that we had not anticipated. And uh, how does one, can one, can one sort of force that or can one encourage that? Can one nurture that kind of networking uh, at a grassroots level? And I think the answer has to be yes, and that we're not very good at it yet. Uh, and we need to get better at it fast. Yeah, really fascinating. I mean, it, it sort of goes to the, it's a political solution, isn't it? It's community organizing and finding ways to empower local communities to solve their own problems and work together is really um, what you're pointing to with that example. Uh, and we're coming very close to the end of our time, but I, I since we've made this point, I wanted to just acknowledge, I think it's Kalechi uh, and Leslie um, we're talking about similar solutions to the agricultural questions. Um, so there's a question about farmer-managed nat natural regeneration, which has been done in 
uh, Niger Republic with similar drought challenges years ago and whether that's been introduced in Madagascar. And Leslie asked about an organization in the US called ECHO that does um, individual uh, family farming, uh, sort of building out efforts to teach individual family farmers to use their land and then move from one farmer to the next to the next. And they're asking to what extent these kinds of things have been tried or might be viable. The, the, these kinds of things are going on. I don't know whether these specific things are going on, but one of the real joys of these kinds of conversations is that I'm learning so much that I didn't know about what is going on in Madagascar. I, I would come back to, to saying that uh, there's a lot happening, but it mostly tends to be very local. And going back to what you said, Lauren, yes, yes, for sure, an essential part of this is find getting these networks of communes working together but it is also sort of the the international partnerships i mean the, the you know the, the, it's a resort it's a it's a poor place so having collaborators at the university of antananarivo who are collaborating with yale university I mean, this has been a long standing yale university of antananarivo uh, partnership that goes on uh because uh you know, it there it doesn't need a lot. It doesn't take a lot of money to make this happen uh, and to help it. And to, it's like having a watering can, if you will, to help nurture these activities. But it does take some. It does take some. And uh, for the foreseeable future, I think that those funds are more likely to come from uh, from you know the US or Europe, the UK, than they are to come out of Madagascar itself. And so this needs to be a partnership, but a a, a partnership of, of 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 mutual respect and trust, rather than a bunch of people holding the purse strings, telling other people what to do. Uh, and I, you know, as I say, Madagascar, everything has moved a very long way in that direction, uh, which is great. It just needs to move a lot further, a lot faster, because uh, you know, there ain't, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of challenge coming down the line as uh, as these climate uh, change events do start to, you know, to roll into sort of the the, the everyday lives of people. Well, thank you for that. I, um, I think that's a great sort of note to wrap up on. Uh, the name of the book is The Sloth Lemur's Song, and I will post again. I muted myself by accident. I'll post again in the chat for anyone who would like to purchase a copy and encourage you to please purchase a copy. Um, and uh, Allison, I think to your point, the partnerships that you're able to um, facilitate on behalf of Yale and with colleagues at Yale and the work that's happening at the School of Environment on climate change, the work that's happening across the university on climate change, that um, supporting our faculty is a way of supporting that work and keeping it moving forward. So thank all of you who turned up to uh, support Professor Allison Richard today. And um, please do go and purchase a copy of her book. And I can say that in ways that she can't. So I'm just going to shamelessly promote, please purchase a copy of the book. <laughs> and I will give you the last word out. Yeah, I was going to say it's only 5.29. Right? <laughs> so, so, so thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. And let me just say, I just, uh, you know, it is wonderful having this opportunity, but how I wish that we were all able to mill around together because I feel that there are just kind of this, I have so much still to learn from everybody who has been part of this conversation today. And uh, and the, there would be such interesting connections to be made. So let us hope, let us look for opportunities to, to, to resume the conversation in other contexts. And my thanks to you all as well. Well, and anyone who wants to reach out to Professor Richard, you can certainly email us at alumniacademy at yale.edu, and we will forward any messages to her. So please do feel free to keep the conversation going that way. And I hope you all will join us for the next climate change conversation. We have two more this week. So please tune in to our alumniacademy.yale.edu website for more information and to register. And thank you, Professor Richard. I look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you.